And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother, sorry, carbonation, coming to us straight from Paleo Gaming, a a man, a man who had pre who had previously d had come forth with Omega Horizon. Now he's back at it, and is and with a with a vengeance as we as we've seen since he was only asking for a thousand and is currently at four thousand and two at the time of this recording. The one and only Daniel Prisco Bucksbaum. I'm hoping I got that right. It's been a while. <laughs> you did, and it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Mildred. Thanks for coming on. I. I get the feeling a lot of people stumble on that last part of it. Uh, yes, Prisco Buxbaum. It surprisingly uh, sounds just like it's spelled, but it is probably the longest last name you've seen. So, yeah, um, there used to be a player on the t on the Minnesota Twins named Doug Minkavich. That's it. Sounds simple, but it was a lot longer of a name. <laughs> um. And he and people would screw up his last name a lot, so I can't I can't say it's the I can't say it's the longest the longest name, and it's certainly not the longest word because I because um if I wanted to cheat I could use the full chemical um name for T for a T10, which I'm not <laughs> going to read off because it is tw it is twenty seven thousand characters long, <laughs> but. It's but it but it's argued that it doesn't count because it's not using letters in the way we would use letters when speaking. It's using them, you know, in a in a as a chemical compound. Sure. Um, much in this much in the same way that I'm pretty sure anybody who's involved with using sodium hates all the Batman jokes. You're right. <laughs> for the for those unaware, it's because sodium's chemical name is Na on the periodic table. Um. So yeah, you get a bunch of those together, you you can figure out the rest. Um but get, getting to saner matters. Now, obviously this has not been your first rodeo with Omega Horizon. And you you had done you had you had um launched it about a year ago. With and the results were not ex were not stellar. But what would you say were some of the big um Big learning experiences that you had that you had in the pro in the process of that. Sure. So uh, we, uh, I mean, out the bat, as a first time creator, it can be really hard to get people to part with their hard earned money when they don't know what kind of a product they're going to get. And so uh, the first error we made was we just set a really high funding goal for our first campaign of of uh, ten thousand, which was a bit ambitious. Um, but, uh, I think the biggest difference, uh, from then to now, one, we've continued developing the game. We've continued to have our team of illustrators, very talented illustrators producing amazing art for the game. Um, so it has a lot more of a polished look, uh, this, this time around. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we've done, which I think has, has made the largest impact on our current performance is uh, we ended up releasing a free-to-download working copy of the core rulebook so that people could get their hands on the game, read it, see if it looks like something they want to play, see that we're competent as, as designers and developers, um, see the breadth of the artwork that is going to be in the game, just basically creating this layer of transparency um, because it can be harrowing, like, you know, everyone works hard and, and there's all these different projects on Kickstarter, which is great that there's all these indie developers, but when you've only got so much money to go around, you can be nervous about like, well, I don't know what kind of a product I'm going to get from this person because they haven't produced anything. So to take some of that fear away and show people we're, we're disciplined, we're dedicated, we're not giving up on this game, we're planning to support it for a long time, we're building a community around it. To, to show people, put our money where our mouth is, and show people the kind of game that we're designing, I think has made the biggest difference. And also, we, we did an actual play 
Uh, we brought in some very experienced actresses who, uh, for example, Jess Parsons was on the Dungeon Run, and Avery Lillijay has done a bunch of stuff, and Heather Drew's done a bunch of stuff. So bringing them in and, and having them with me help show people how the game is played and the kind of stories you can tell in this universe, I think, has also been a really uh, major boon to us. And I know that there's a lot of people that discovered the game through that that backed on day one. So I think it definitely has made a difference. Mm-hmm. Um. You end, you ended up breaking you ended up breaking ground when it can, when it comes to that because well a lot of ac- a lot of actual plays that I've seen barely ever go into how their their particular game is played, um, but that that's just a pet peeve of that's just a um, pet peeve of mine. Um, now, as I as I understand it, last last time around you you had mentioned that even though Omega Horizon is very clearly a science fiction project, it is. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily lean into one um, one subtype of science fiction more than others. It's very much a grab bag of whatever of whatever you guys happen to like at the time. Yeah. So so we've been calling it space punk, <laughs> but it's uh, it really does straddle a bunch of different uh, sort of corners of the sci-fi genre. Um, you know, if you're playing a Yamato game, it has a very strong cyberpunk feel. If you're playing in the Free Colonies, it's a space western. Um, the Centennium Empire feels a lot like a space opera or space marine type game. Um, you, if you're playing in the Vanadium Union, there's this sort of uh, high sci-fi exploration and diplomacy, almost like a Starfleet element to it. So, like, there's a lot you can do in this universe. Um and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback that it, it sort of brings in everyone around the table who may have slightly different tastes, but they all feel like they've got a place in this universe. Mm-hmm. Um, in that in that regard, I'd like I'd like to go through I'd like to go through a few names when it comes to when it comes to SF and and how you and how you might replicate that experience in Omega Horizon, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. Sure. All right, let's go. Let's go with one of the bigger recent names. Um, the Expanse. Sure. So, uh, rules as written, uh, Omega Horizon does play as more of a uh, space opera e game a la Star Wars as opposed to The Expanse. There are some uh, liberties that we take with physics uh, through the use of Omega Elements. However, uh, with very little tweaking, you can up the realism of the game to play a more expanse like game and i would say that especially if you're setting your game in the free colonies where people are playing as scavengers and resources are hard to come by that will very quickly develop an expanse like theme oh all right um battlestar galactica specifically the the um re- the reboot that was done but that was on by um that was that was on that was on um, sci-fi a few years back that w- that was done by um, geez, why why can I not remember his na- why can I not remember the writer's name at the uh, at at this time um, it'll probably co- it'll probably come to me later but that was the one in the in the um, early two thousands right so I am less familiar with Battlestar Galactica but sort of off the cuff from my limited knowledge I would say that probably would fit well in a Vanadium Union game. Uh, because my understanding is this, there's a sort of shadow faction behind the main faction, and in the Vanadium Union, there's something similar going on, where you have the primary voices of the Union um, are believers, they're true believers in the message of the Union, of, de- you know, democracy and inclusion of all these different species, but there's a, uh, a sub-faction called the Vanadium Dominion that seeks to subjugate other species and wants to focus on military strength. And so you have this um, this sort of intrigue going on of who's actually a member of the Dominion versus a member of the Union. So I would say that that seems like Battlestar Galactica from my limited understanding of it. All right. Um, let's get let's get a little let's get a little bit um oh let's do a little bit of a jo- of a genre sidestep. Um, Alien. Yeah, absolutely. Aliens actually need... You pitched me a softball there because uh, the Rogozian Swarm is very reminiscent of uh, of the uh, 
H.R. Geiger sort of alien creatures. I mean, if you look at our illustration for the Rogozian Queen, I think most people would look at that and say, well, that looks somewhat similar to a Xenomorph Queen. Um, so, yeah, I would say if you set... Uh, you can do it in any faction you can run a Rogozian campaign, but especially if you want to run a Space Marine-esque game, you set it in the Centennium Empire on the front lines in the war against the Swarm in the Grand Crusade, and right there you've got uh, a very alien-esque game of Space Marines, you know, running through cavernous passageways that are just overrun with, uh, you know, cutthroat aliens. Well, give, given that, I'd, I'd like to i like to spin that slightly. Um, how how would it handle the more space trucker end of a, end of alien? That's why I referred. That's why I brought up alien and not aliens. Okay. Sure. No. No. That's fair. That's fair. I would say definitely in that case you'd want to set it in the free colonies. Uh, you could do some sort of a, a heavy freighter, a lighter or a heavy freighter. Uh, that's hauling materials over deep space and somehow picks up a hitchhiker and uh, and do it that way, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, might, this might be a bit of a stretch to, th to throw it in this, but if somebody wants, but let's say, let's say somebody wants to run something a little bit more investigative um, oh, with a, lo a little bit noir-esque a la um, Blade Runner. Sure. Uh, if someone wants to run a more noir investigative campaign, my recommendation would be to set it in the Yamato Empire. Uh, I think that lends itself corporate uh, intrigue, corporate espionage, certainly factors into the Yamato Empire, the mega corporations constantly vying for control and, and bending the rules to their will. Um, and if you really want to go noir, you could actually even go sort of 1920s noir by setting it in cyberspace. Uh, because cyberspace in our universe is less like the Matrix and more like Ready Player One, where areas are sort of themed, and uh, you could do lots of imaginative stuff. In you could set entire campaigns just in cyberspace if you wanted to. It's fun. It's funny you mentioned that kind of thing because there's been a um, there's been an adventure game that's been that's been in the works for a little while called Game Deck. That's <laughs> kind. That's kind of doing that. Yeah, yeah. I th I, we actually, uh, for those who haven't watched the actual play that we did yet, uh, in Act 3, we did a four-act actual play that covered a lot of ground for the game. And in Act 3, the players spent a lot of time in cyberspace, and they actually ended up going on a chase that took them through multiple themed areas. So, like, they ended up on a pirate ship in the middle of, like, uh, a fight between two galleons, and then they were underwater and then it went to a superhero uh basically a game within a game it was uh it was ttrpg seception for a minute there and uh and we should we sort of showcase the interesting ways that you can flip the genre using cyberspace as a a palette yeah and since you mentioned that i was i was going to bring up inception but since you given how you describe cyberspace i'm pretty sure that just answered my own question um yeah so, in, so instead, instead of instead of that, I'll go with um, Babylon Five. That definitely is Vanadium Union, the, the melting pot of species and and uh, the social uh, stakes between the species and everything. I would say that definitely fits the Vanadium Union. In fact, Babylon Five as this idea of a station that was meant to be this sort of joint. Um, endeavor between the species as a push for peace and prosperity. Um, the Vanadium Union has this massive space station called uh, Unity that is exactly that. It's this massive space station that is meant to be this melting pot and it's meant to bring people together. All right, it's it's kind of it's kind of leaned into into S into SF and leaned into Cyberpunk in some forms. Or another, but let me go a little bit bonkers again. Judge Dredd. Uh, Judge Dredd, if I had to off the cuff pick one, I would say that seems like you could either set it in the Centennium Empire or you could set it in the Yamato Empire and, you know, build yourself sort of a task force of, uh, of marshals that are laying down the law. I mean, you could really set it anywhere, though. You could do a free colony game where the, the ruling council that has been set up in the absence of one of the major empires um is the hall of law right that that's that's what you're dealing with and now you're enforcers for the hall of law certainly yeah um i 
I real I realize that one is a that one is a bit of a stretch because uh, because of the kind of set the kind of setting that Mega City One is, but it's um it's not too far removed from 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 elements of from elements of cyberpunk, especially the punk part, which I think I think, a lot I think it yeah I think it absolutely fits in in cyberpunk. I think it's uh I think it's a grittier cyberpunk but i think it's absolutely cyberpunk and you definitely could do a game like that like i said the interesting thing about omega horizon is that you can decide um on what scale you want to run a campaign and a campaign can either take place in a single city or on a single planet or in a single sector or across it could span the entire galaxy um you know and there's when we if i had to pick one word to describe omega horizon it's customization customization of your characters on a very fine-tuned level you could even make your own careers and make your own backgrounds customization of the setting to make it fit the kind of story you want to tell and even so far as customization of the complexity of the rules via us creating this sliding complexity scale where you can either run a more narrative game that has minimal rules or you could run a really crunchy game that people really are delving into the math and min maxing and trying to squeeze every iota of a modifier out of the current situation as they can the the control is in your hands so that it will in my in my mind appeal to every group because you can make it your own in a way that a lot of games don't do a lot of games are just like this is the game you like it you're not right like you play warhammer warhammer is a crunchy game if you're playing the warhammer ttrpg you're like referencing tables all the time it's crunchy if you're playing, you know, Sagas of Midgard, it's a narrative game. If you're looking for help figuring out what to roll, you're not going to find it because it's going to be really story focused. And it's a, that's it. They're both great games, by the way. I chose those games because I think they're great games, but they're very different on the spectrum. And depending on your group and how flexible your group is, they're going to like it or they're going to hate it. Mm -hmm. Omega Horizon gives them that flexibility to be like, well, where do we want it to fall? And we can control that. And, and it's not all or nothing. You can change that through the course of the game. You could say, all right, I'll give you an example. That, again, referring to this actual play, because I think it's a great... We worked very hard to make it very representative of the kind of games you could run. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that cyberspace encounter, when they entered the program called Heroes Destiny, and they were superheroes, um, first they were confronted by wave after wave of these robots, these flying robots. And if you try to run combat like that with hundreds of enemies, it's going to take the entire session, and we didn't want to do that. So we switched it to very narrative, cinematic rules. A single roll was made. They bested the waves of en enemies with that single roll. And then for the next 10 minutes, they just got to describe how they just dumpster these robots, right? And the players feel powerful, and they feel in control, and that's a great feeling that they feel like heroes. And then we shift to the boss fight, and that's when we made it crunchy again. And we're like, all right, well, now figure out your modifiers. You're fighting this. They fought this um, digital kaiju, basically. And so now they're using their superpowers to try to fight this thing. And that, you you now transition that to crunchy rules because you want every roll to matter. You want it to feel like the battle is hinged upon every roll and every decision matters. So being able to seamlessly switch between more narrative rules and more complex rules, I think, is a boon. Mm -hmm. Now... With that, with that um, sliding scale, I want I want to talk a bit about that, because um, whenever whenever I think of that kind of that kind of sliding scale, one of the, especially when it comes to complexity, one of the big instances that comes to mind is fusion, spelled with a Z, because of course, okay. um, which was an attempt to to have this well fusion of elements between interlock and the hero system. <clears throat> um, it's not. I wouldn't exactly call it the same sliding scale of complexity, but it. But it's not far off. But how how do you how do you go about representing this um, sliding um, complexity scale mechanically? So, the important thing I think when you're going to create a flexible system is you need to have a degree of consistency. So. Let's start and say, all right, rules as written, rules as written are, are very complex, right? Mm -hmm. we, we use the more narrative play rules as an alternate rule set that you can fall back on. But the rules as written are pretty crunchy. And then we make recommendations through the book of like how to then shift it and make it more narrative. So at the top end, the first thing you do is 
if you want to start making it more narrative, is cut out the environmental effects. Leave players modifiers from their skills and from their tools, whatever, but cut out the environment. Don't worry if it's slippery. Don't worry if it's rain. Don't worry about any of that stuff. That's the first thing that goes, is get rid of the environment. Mm -hmm. The next thing that happens is you say, all right, well, now there's still all these tools, whatever else. Get rid of that next. Start limiting modifiers as you're moving down that scale to make it more narrative. Then, So at that point, now you're saying, all right, we got rid of all our modifiers. Maybe we're just keeping our skill ranks, um, the specialty ranks, and our basic roles, and that's it. Fine, great. But now you still have a lot of roles being made over the course of a battle. So as you start shifting more and more, you start saying, well, all right, don't make them roll for everything, right? Maybe in an encounter, they only roll when they are fighting the boss. But if the boss has minions, they never roll with the minions. They just spend their action points and they can finish off minions on a one-for-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you keep cutting back and cutting back until you say, well, they're not even fighting a boss for this. They're really just fighting minions. If I look at this, there's no reason they should be rolling. It's just going to waste time and go through the initiative count. So let's not do that. Instead, we're just going to take all of their skills and all of their traits, add them together, turn that into a modifier, do the same thing with the enemies. Take, take a, you know, you want to compare apples to apples. So you say if there's three players, take the three best enemies, combine their traits, and make a single roll, adding those modifiers. And whoever wins will win the battle. And then you let their actions sort of tweak it a little bit to be like, all right, well, if let's say that you roll and they lost, they can mitigate that loss to a minor loss by doing cool things with their actions narratively. Or if they win, but they do something really cool, well, then they just flat out wreck their opponents. But if they struggle a little bit with their descriptions, well, then it's sort of a, a victory they squeak by on or whatever the case may be. It, you, the answer is it becomes based on creativity and storytelling mm -hmm. and less about just the math behind the numbers. The other thing we did that gave players more agency, which I think is really important and games don't do enough of, is we added a system called Tokens of Destiny. So a character creation, players choose this important token of destiny, whether it's a physical object or a scar or a story or whatever it is, it's something that resonates with their character. And once per session, they can use it for a really amazing bonus, whether that's turning a normal success into a critical success or ignoring all damage from a single source for a round or generating a lead if the players seem lost and are scratching their heads. They can generate a meaningful lead that's tied to their character. But it gives them more control over the results of the game and it makes them feel more involved in the storytelling and it also gives a real reason for them to work on a backstory because I think you and I as experienced role players know um, quite often your backstory is something that you do during session is never mentioned again and is not relevant to the story at all so to give them something that purposefully keeps bringing up their backstory and lets them actually add to their backstory right because they can be like all right you know I designed this backstory, it's kind of simplistic, but now the first time I use my Token of Destiny, I'm like, oh, that part that we're missing and we can't find anywhere, I know someone who would have that because I helped him do this thing. And now you go there, and now the story's getting built, and you start fleshing out that backstory more as you play in an organic way, mm -hmm. which I think is cool. Yeah. Now, one, now, um, one of the things that I, one of the things that I found it, that I find interesting regarding the setup that you have is... In the, is in the core mechanic in the in the place where all roads lead to Rome, um, and that is the fact that you're using a D6 based roll and keep. Um, now I'm no stranger to roll and keep, obviously being a veteran of Seven C and Legend of the Five Rings and the insanity that is Dungeons of the Dragoning, but <laughs> a lot of those other roll and keep games utilize D10s, right? Um, what was or in an early stage were you using d10s as well or were you always using d6s so in the earliest alpha we actually were using a success failure d10 system and i didn't feel that it properly captured the scope of the game especially in particular when it came to um starship battles and stuff um we then briefly attempted a D10 roll and keep system, but the problem with D10 is that you have a really wide range. Um, and so I found that running a D10 system, too often players were either whiffing or obliterating enemies 
and they weren't really hitting that middle ground. And I find that by dialing it down, tightening it up to a D6 system, you control that range more. Um, and certainly, I'm not going to lie, I mean, it, it required extra balancing on our part because it's not something you see often. Even if it is a D6 system, the roll and keep D6 is very rare. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I have found that it, it creates more consistency in the range of rolls. GPMP system. Them for health and it's allowed us to sort of normalize weapon damage and do a bunch of other things that were harder to do with the d10 system um that the d6 system allows us to do but i i acknowledge that it is uh far afield from what is uh, normally accepted and i'm hoping that it makes us unique mm -hmm. <clears throat> and What's this, what was especially telling when it came to the whole unique part of it is the fact that um, I didn't, and it's and this is why it's interesting that you mentioned that swinginess. I did not see any instance of die explosion. Um, there is not. There is not which, die explosion. No. Which I think it would be understandable because trying to do die explosion on sixes in this regard might result in things get a little getting a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, so we do have a what we call a critical success mechanic, um, and critical successes do a couple different things. One, if the, uh, let's say, we'll use attacks just as one instance. Mm -hmm. If the attack would miss, instead it hits by the Armatian exactly. Um, in addition, critical successes on attack rolls ignore damage reduction from armor and stuff. Um, so they feel meaningful when you get them, but to get them you have to roll three or more sixes, which is tough to do on a roll unless you have a really high uh, pool of dice. Mm -hmm. uh, and dice rolls are capped at ten dice uh, for skill rolls, which attack rolls are a skill roll anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, even with the critical success, it's different than an explosion mechanic where you can sort of, if you get a lucky roll, you can stack to infinity. Uh, we didn't really feel you needed to, and also because health pools in Omega Horizon are not gigantic to begin with, um, an explosion mechanic would lead to um, some chaotic situations where people just get one-shotted by enemies, um, and I, I didn't think that made sense, and you don't need an explosion mechanic to take down enemies. You can wear them down through intelligent strategic play and um, sustained damage. So, we I did consider it. I'm not gonna lie. I I was in the early stages of it, considering doing an explosion mechanic. But during early alpha play testing, um, I didn't like the results we were getting when there were explosions. Um, and so I ultimately I found it was against the players' favor more than it was in their favor, given the fact that often, as is the trope in sci-fi and fantasy games, the players are often outnumbered. Which means, statistically, it is more likely someone else will explode against them than it is they will explode against their enemies. Yeah. Now, when it comes... Now, when it comes to... Since you mentioned combat, that's one other thing that I did want to tackle. Um, when, it com when it comes to... When it comes to SF, depending on the type of um, SF or space or space punk, um, comb combat tends to... Ha tends to be in varying degrees of squishiness. Um, mm -hmm. One of the more infamous examples for me at a young age was the Babylon Project, which can, which, um, is, can be particularly nasty. And of course, there's always the infamy that is Traveler, where a few good, or a few good solid hits will do you in pretty quick. So your, the question is, how, how high is the mortality rate in our game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm more, I'm more curious about. It. Is it a, is it a case where you, ha where it, a lot of, the, a lot of times when you have something that's on the squishy end of things, you have low health pools and high damage weapons. So I think that the weapon damage is geared towards the health pools. It keeps the health pools in mind. There's also active ways of mitigating. Uh, chance to hit or mitigating damage. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, cover is included in our game, and hiding behind cover 
can give you defense bonuses, or if it's full cover, then actually it spares you from any damage. Uh, the cover takes the damage. Um, there are different forms of armor that give you damage reduction that reduces incoming damage. Uh, in addition, a successful tumble skill roll halves all incoming damage um, before damage reduction is even applied. Um, but the other thing is it happens, right? Like, you have some people that make really specialized characters. I'll use an example of, like, let's say a hacker who has very low BP, very high MP because they plan on operating in cyberspace, but in order to get to wherever they need to jack in, sometimes they end up in a gunfight, and now they're in trouble. Mm-hmm. I I was keenly aware of that and I didn't I didn't want to make a high mortality game by itself. Certainly I discuss in the rules that if you want to make it a high mortality game, let's say you're doing a sort of a We Were Soldiers Centennium Empire campaign, you want there to be gore and horror and, and high fatality. You you could do that. You could do that. But Rules as written, I didn't want mortality to be this fear on the part of the players. I wanted them to be having fun. So, um, certainly you can get taken down uh, reasonably with weapons fire. But the medic skill, specifically triage, allows you to bring a player back to 1 BP as long as you make a successful skill roll. And the skill roll is based on how far into the negatives they were pushed and how many rounds it's been since they were pushed there. And through playtesting very often, it meant that a roll of 7 to 10 was enough to bring a player back. And there's no limit to the amount of times you can do that. So as long as a few of you have taken at least a smattering of, of the medical skill roll, you can keep booping each other back to life, uh, essentially indefinitely. Um, which means unless you're really careless or your GM happens to be exceptionally punishing, there shouldn't be a reason you should really be afraid of having your character die in most cases. Mm -hmm. Sorry, carbonation. Um, Quite all right. Now, when it now, one of the th when it, when it comes to when it, came, when it came to character creation. Now, obviously, Omega Horizon is a, is a fairly <clears throat> A, fair, a fairly a fairly um free form approach it's everything goes everything goes down to spending ca spending character points um obviously with a, obviously with a few exceptions but for the mo but I'd say for the most part that's where all roads lead to sure um one partic but this is where I have to get into um what I've unfortunately had to nickname the shadow run problem wherein Wherein there, wherein you have a very specific pool and a lot, and I mean a lot, of skills to put to put points into, and that's and of course putting, of course you have to have a certain number of points put into attributes as well, um, and that's one of those things that is that is a um com that is a common factor in analysis paralysis. Sure, and and that's a, a really uh, good point that you're making. It's something I was very, very conscious of. And in fact, I think that this is one of actually the best, the strongest elements of our system. You don't have to put points into every skill. Because we have a nested skill tree system, you have skill groups and you have individual skills. And all of those individual skills rely on a skill group Role. So what that means, we'll look at one specific example. The athletics skill group includes the skills balance, climb, jump, ride, swim, and tumble. Skills that are found in Dungeons and & Dragons and many other tabletop role-playing games. They're your primary means of interacting with your environment. Mm -hmm. All of those skills rely on an athletics skill roll, where you roll a number of dice equal to your athletics skill group, and you keep a number of dice based on either agility or strength based on the individual skills. So strength for climbing, agility for balance, etc. That's true for all those skills. So just by investing in athletics, you can do all of those skills relatively well. The specialty ranks bolster your minimal your minimum role, but I even put in the core rule book under the skill section that you get much more bang for your buck by increasing your skill groups, especially early on, 
until you start hitting higher ranks. And then you can turn to the specialty ranks as a way of sort of saving yourself CP if you're really specifically looking to pick up a specific skill. But generally speaking, your skill groups are what you want to focus on, and they will give you access to this very wide range of, um, of skills that you can do. Yeah. Um, now, with, with, that in, with that in mind... I'd, I w- would it so based based on what you've been saying um things like balance climb etc those are those are added on to the attribute skill formula if I've got that right uh, yeah so they become flat modifiers so if you have for example four in athletics and three in strength and you want to make a climb skill roll you roll four dice for your athletics you keep the three highest results adding them together and then that number, you add whatever your specialty rank and climb is to. Yeah. Now, that that being that being said, there is one. As somebody who's um, been inundated with roll and keep for many for many years, um, there is one flaw with ro- with roll and keep that's often be- that's often been discussed, but nobody's ever come up with a reliable solution to um that and that is that is the fact that especially especially in the early days of L5R and 7th C it was it was far more incentivized to uh, to um put more of your points into attributes and less so in skills because putting a because putting a point into a skill just meant that it was an extra die that you would roll Whereas putting a point into an attribute meant an extra die you would be rolling and keeping. Uh, so in this case, you don't roll dice for your trait. You only keep dice for your trait. Which actually means you're incentivized to try to keep them somewhat balanced. Um, if anything, I think it actually does prioritize the skill over the trait. Because, uh, as, as an example, in that 4K3 example, let's say you had bumped up your traits more. Let's say you were rolling 4, but you actually had 5 in your trait. Mm-hmm. That means you're rolling 4K5. 4K5 reduces, because you can't keep more than you roll, reduces to 4K4 plus 1. It becomes a flat plus 1 modifier. It's cheaper to just buy a specialty rank for a plus 1 modifier than increase a whole trait. Um... Meanwhile, if you increase your athletics instead to 6k4, you do a couple of things. One, you increase the likelihood of a critical success, because you're rolling another die, which means there's another chance of getting a 6. Uh, and two, every die that you roll has an average roll of 3, which means every additional die you roll and the off chance you get something low, you're more likely to get a higher result by rolling an additional die. I think it favors um, skill groups improvement over trait improvement. Mm-hmm. Now, that now um, one of the given the fa- given the fact that you have a variety of um of species, yeah, in in play, um. One thing, one thing I'm one thing I'm curious about is how much of how much of a factor does play does playing a non does playing a um does playing a certain species have on ca- on char- on character set on character setup. Since some for some games it's for some games it determines attribute and maximums. For some games they'll give you a little a bit of a gimmick. Um, where do you fit into that spectrum? So typically it gives you a bit of a gimmick. Um, usually it gives you. I, I try to give every species benefits and drawbacks, with the exception of humans. Humans don't currently have a drawback in the rules as written. Um, so for example, if you're playing as um, if you're playing as the Yuanji, you start out with additional levels in um, your agility and your strength and your constitution. They heal faster. They get a bunch of gimmicks, but they also can't take any genetic modifications and they can't take any tech augments, which can be a major drawback because those things can add really cool stuff for your character. So we try very hard to create this balance that if you look at all of the species together, hopefully if we've done our, our jobs right, and, and that has been the um, the feedback we've gotten so far, if you look at all these species, none of them should jump out and be like, well, this is the best. 
The answer is depending on what kind of character you want to play, some of them make a lot of sense for that type of career mm -hmm. because they have certain benefits which are really cool. But again, customization is key for us. So you could become just as skilled of a pilot doing any other species. Uh, as an example, using piloting as a as a career choice, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so they should all be relatively balanced. But they come with some gimmicks, like for example, Kilfin out the gate have a caffeine addiction, like weird, weird, funny things. Like some of them just have these gimmicks to them. Um, but certainly, you can you can make whatever kind of characters you want to make with whatever species you want to want to make. I will say that recently we did give humans a little bit of a buff because we found through playtesting that people overwhelmingly were ditching humans by the wayside, um, which is kind of unusual in a tabletop game. Typically, people don't like playing outside their comfort zone, so in most groups, you you will default to human for most people, and then people you know you have the smattering of people playing other species. Um, so when we looked at that, we found that because we had spent so much time focusing on making the other species really cool and gimmicky, humans became very bland. And so we recently buffed them in the current, uh, edition of the playtesting document where, um, they actually, there's a new ability called human ingenuity where they can increase the core skill groups that they have from their career. They can increase the level of those skill group ranks at a cheaper CP cost. To represent the adaptability of humans. All right, that that makes sense. Um, now, when it comes now, we've we've talked we've talked a f we've talked a fair bit about boots on the ground kinds of kinds of combat. Um, I'd like to shift a, I'd like to shift a bit into space combat because, well, if you're going to do space punk, it would be it would behoove you to have to have you to have some space combat because sure look. I've, Look, everybody. Everybody wants to be Rogue Squadron. Let's let's not beat around the bush. Here. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, given that given that I given that I broke the ice with that, I I have to ask the obvious que the obvious question. Dog fighting. How is Omega Horizon handling dog fighting? Um, that's a good question. We we do handle dog fighting, and again, it is handled in a more aerodynamic Star Wars esque way that makes it more exciting. Um, we have a lot of interesting rules about how to deal with, for example, um, ordnance that can track your ship and different maneuvers and um, evasive maneuvers, and how all of your piloting skill impacts dog fighting, how fighting between different size classes, for example, doing strafing runs against battleships, we've got rules for that. Um, what I will say that we're still struggling with a little, struggling is not the right word, but what we're still debating is whether we want to create a system of system failures as rules as written, or if we want as an alternative set where, like, for example, various systems can go down in your ship and require sort of spot fixes. Um, we're we're still play testing those rules to see if they fit in the rules as written, or if we want to just throw them in for the people who prefer crunchier, uh, crunchier interactions in space combat. But yeah, we we definitely we have an entire section just devoted to starships and vehicles. We have a ton of starships and vehicles that will be available in the core rulebook, all of which will get really cool illustrations from our very talented illustrators. Um, we, we're, we spend a lot of time and focus on it, so I think that people who really like space combat will not be disappointed. Yeah, um, that brings me that brings me to the, to the concept of how of how you'd handle essentially co essentially combined arms um, conflicts if it if a if it came, if a campaign came to that, i.e., um, small i.e. smaller ships and larger ships in this in the same encounter. Sure. So, so we do have size differential mechanics where uh, bigger things firing on smaller things get uh, their attack rolls penalized. Uh, smaller things firing on bigger things get a bonus to hit. Mm -hmm. um, damage scales where larger larger classes of weapons get a multiply multiplier on their damage, which is balanced against the fact that they have much larger hull point pools. Um, so you, as a, and of course they also have damage reduction, so as a smaller ship peppering a bigger ship, it takes a lot more effort for you to take the bigger ship down, whereas two large ships uh, that are bombarding each other will take each other down uh, with relative ease. Mm -hmm. um, 
but when a larger ship faces a smaller ship, it is nigh impossible for them to hit it. Uh, in the example of a, a starfighter versus a battleship, it's nearly impossible for the battleship to hit the smaller ship um, with their main weapons, but they'll have smaller scale weapons as point defense weapons that will have a chance to hit the ship. But that becomes a um, a fairer fight, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's easier for the starship pilots to avoid those weapons and so on and so forth. And it gives a reason that, you know, battleships need to go with cadres of starfighters to defend against other small uh, small ships. And it, I think it creates this really nice um, sort of blend of different ship classes in battles because you, you need to have these different ship classes to straddle the, that divide. Mm-hmm. And... Now with now with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, would it would it be fair to would it be fair to say that um, that Omega Horizon is more comfortable in theater of the mind more than more than a full on a full on grid system? Yes, I would say that is the case. Um, one of our stretch goals is for battle maps uh, that will be primarily ground battle maps. Um, because on the ground, it's more conducive to that. But personally, I only run Omega Horizon Theater of the Mind. I think that's where it excels. Um, especially when you start to bridge that divide of like, all right, well, you know, we have all these people on land running around, but then we have drones that are moving at, you know, supersonic speeds. It gets very hard in sci-fi to do grid maps, I think. Um, we do address it. We address the, you know, if you're moving at these different speeds, how that affects your ability to interact with battles. Um, you know, pros and cons. It's harder to hit you, but it's harder for you to hit things and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I think Theater of the Mind is definitely the superior choice for, for the games I run, at least. Mm-hmm. Now, this, now there's one, there's some. Um... There's one particular aspect in in science fiction that's always been a very a very scub discussion. Um, some some people really don't like its inclusion because it because it ends up throwing things out of whack. Some people get flashbacks to when this was used in the early days of D and D, where they could never get it right to their own admission. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about psionics. <laughs> yeah, sure. So. I do appreciate that psionics is an, is another skill group, mm-hmm. um, but when it come when it comes to when it comes to its use, is it is it would it be primarily used as ju- as just a as just a type of skill role, or are there are there some extra caveats thrown into it? Uh, caveats how in ter- in terms of a limited pool, a risk of blowback. Okay. Um, uh, no, there, there's no limited pool or, or risk of blowback. Um, it is it is expensive. It is prohibitively expensive as uh, something you just want to do a little bit of. You can do it, but you're you're better off focusing on it because increasing your psionic is a skill group, but also a trait. And increasing that trait is expensive. It's the new rank times seven. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it is not an overpowered combat class. So there is a combat skill within the psionic skill group called Mind Blade that uh, only works against organic creatures. It doesn't work against androids or other constructs. Um, But you have to make a skill roll to hit the enemy's mind, total mind, which is their mental defense, and then you get to roll your damage. But psionic damage uh, normally is only 1k1, which is a very low number compared to most of the weapon classes. And uh, even if you take the Inquisitor career, that only increases your damage to 2k1. It's still not a very large number. Now, on the one hand, there's no way to defend against it, right? The damage, there's no DR against psionic damage. So that's sort of the trade-off is that it's true damage, if you will, to the person's MP. And MP tends to be... A lower stat for most people. Most people focus on BP more than MP, unless they're playing a hacker or a very mental class. Um, so that is a benefit of psionic attacks. But still, uh, we often have people who play psionic characters who will still carry a weapon because they feel they can do more damage. So psionics are more of a utility approach 
in Omega Horizon than they are just these mind popping maniacs. Um, and people like it. I mean, it, we in every playtesting game I've run, we've had at least one Sion character. Yeah. Um, it's useful to be able to read people's minds or detect where enemies are or create illusions or all these other things. Um, and uh, and people do enjoy playing them. I would say that the two most popular elements that I've seen over and over again in my and others' playtesting groups is there's always at least one Psyonic character and there's always at least one Android. Mm-hmm. Are the two most popular uh, themes that get portrayed. Oh. All right. Now, give now given that I don't um I have all, I of course there's also the whole there's a couple of things regarding traits that I find I find a bit interesting. Mm-hmm. Um when it comes to when it comes to body and mind. Um I don't think I think I'm I think I'm ac- I think I'm reading this right that they are calculated based on the based on the three main um tr- the three main traits so for body that would be strength agility and constitution um was that done to prevent a prevent um the dump stat issue that can happen um, yes and yes and no i don't think there are real dump stats in omega horizon to be honest um but it's not just those three, it's also what we call the secondary traits. So for body, it's your strength, agility, and constitution, but it's also your genetics and augment traits. Mm-hmm. And for mind, it's your intellect, wits, and charisma, but also your cybernetics and psionics. Um, they all factor into your total body and your total mind, which are your health pools. Um, as far as quote-unquote dump traits or dump stats, they every trait is usable for something significant, right? So, like, yes, if you're playing a character who is not social to speak of, then likely you will not put into charisma, but you may put into cybernetics or something, and that will lift your mind trait as a result. Mm-hmm. Uh, or maybe you're you're very perceptive, perceptive as a soldier-type character, so you put a lot into your wits to increase your perception skill roles. So you will still find ways of increasing your mind. Similarly, the same thing goes for your body. Maybe you're a character who who is more mental, but maybe to gird yourself a little bit, you take some tech augmentation and that increases your body or you, you know, have some genetic modifications that increase your body. Um, The main difference between the three, what we call core traits and the two secondary traits for each body and mind is the three core traits are increased on a pure spending basis. You spend CP, you increase the trait. Mm -hmm. The secondary, with the exception of psionics, psionics does work that way, and it's more expensive, where you just buy rank by rank. But cybernetics, augment, and genetics are traits that are derived from specific hardware or augmentations that you purchase as a unit. So, like, you buy an ocular implant, that is an augment. It gives you an ability... And in addition, it contributes to your augment trait. And with each additional augment you buy, it's contributing a certain amount of trait points to your augment trait in addition to whatever else it does. Now, when it comes to augmentations, whether they be physical or mental, in in a lot of in a lot of cyberpunk games, there's usually there's usually some sort of upper limit to them. Um, for example, there's hum- there's um, humanity in cy- in Cyberpunk 2020, um, right? Whereas there, whereas there is essence in um, in Shadowrun, and you go to you go too far, you go too low on either one, and you end up becoming an NPC because you're ju- you're just a cyber zombie at that point. Sure. Um, is there is there a similar or is there a similar kind of upper limit, or is the limit when it comes to um, cybernetics mainly mainly how much you can spend? Yeah, there there is no limit to how much you can do. Honestly, I find it to be less than creative to create that limit. Um, I think that one of the great philosophical questions that we get to to um, tackle in a, a cyberpunk game and in a in a futuristic game is what is humanity and where is that line. And so I think to just create an arbitrary number and be like, the line is essence, and when you get too many things, you stop being human, I think um, it takes the piss out of that question to some extent, and I don't like it. 
I think the answer should be is it's a question we're always asking that we don't have a definitive answer to. Um, so I did not want to limit how much tech people can include into themselves uh, before they quote unquote stop being human. Um, the only current limit um, or limits uh, aside from how much CPU you have to spend, on the one hand, uh, the augments and cybernetics, there's a, a limited amount we've put into the game so far, and they, they do functionally different things. And so there's certain redundancies if you were to try to take this. You can't take the same thing over and over again, so that's a limit. Mm -hmm. um, and then for genetics, because it's taking up space in your genetic markers, there's only so many genetics of a certain type you can take. Like, you can take a limited number of modifications that target your nervous system or target your dermis or whatever the case may be um only because they start interfering with each other at a certain point there's only so much modification you can do before it starts doing nothing mm. um but the trade-off to that is we created a sort of um a cp neutrality rule where if you want to change your genetic modifications you can without having to you just spend the difference if it's more expensive but you never just lose it by overriding it, and you can override those modifications. So respecking is an option in genetics, yeah. Um, and I'm getting you, just, you have to you finish you you visit a gene doctor, and they can inject you with a bunch of stuff with the auto injector, and then you change what your gene mods are. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, one of the one of the other key things that you that you guys have that you guys have talked about on the on the page is the is the fact that you're using a using an action point um system. Yeah. And that's something I wholeheartedly approve of. I'd like to see more games do that instead of instead of doing the, instead of doing the um t the tier of actions or or just or just a or just a set move and it move and move attack and what and whatever. Um, sure. <laughs> formula. But what I am what I am curious about is reactions. Now, sure. some games that some games that I've seen do reactions um are put have them drawing from the same pool and some have it that that there's a set number of reactions that you that you can do. And then there's cases like say Traveler where you can do as many you can do as many as you want. You don't have any limit, you just can't do the same type of reaction twice. Sure. Where do you fit in that paradigm? Yes. <laughs> um, the answer is a little bit of everything. Uh, we do have reactions. The reactions borrow from your available action points on your next turn. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't do more than you have action points to spend. Um, certain reactions are also limited uh, by some of your traits. So, for example... Um, let's say you can only parry a number of attacks based on your, uh, agility. You can't exceed that number. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some things are just free. Some things, if it's a simple enough reaction, uh, then you can just keep doing it. Um, and that's, that's on a case by case basis. It's addressed in the book under specific things that can be done re reactively or reflexively. Um, it, it varies. Um, we we, we tend to give a lot of thought during development of whether or not something makes sense. We want things to logically line up. And as long as we feel it logically lines up, we don't get too bent out of shape about like, but, but this thing says, um, specific text in our game always trumps generic rules. So if, a, if the generic rule says you can't do more than X, Y, Z of this, but then something else says you can do this as much as you want, then you can do it as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Um... We, uh, the action point system is something we're very proud of. We think it gives players a lot of agency. Again, we're all about agency and customization. You should be able to customize your turns the same way you're able to customize your character. If you want to spend the turn just moving all three times, then you should do that. If you want to not move and do a bunch of things, then that's what you should do. Uh, we even have ways of getting additional action points. So the standard pool is three, but if you have additional limbs, that adds action points. Um, so if you use tech augments to get an extra set of arms, you buy yourself two additional action points each round with that extra set of arms. Um, there's even a class that is ba a career that is based around gifting an action point every turn, every round. Um, we wanted to create a support class, which we created the medic, um, but we didn't want them to be relegated to heal bots. So we gave them this interesting fiddly bit where 
they can name a partner um, and they can once per per round shift who that partner is and that partner gets an additional action point as long as the medic is within a certain range of them represented as them offering support whether it's tossing them a clip to reload or whatever the case may be um, and so it allows them to help control the action point economy and the flow of the game without just feeling like a pu- purely that driven support character mm-hmm. now when, given that you've talked quite a bit about customiz- about customization, mm-hmm. um, I wanted to ask if if um, we- if weapon and armor customization is something that you guys are considering. It is, and in fact, more than just weapons and armor, because we are considering that, but more than weapons and armor, something that I've been thinking long and hard about is starship customization putting in rules in the core rulebook to build custom starships with some sort of a point buy system. Mm -hmm. Um, I really want to do it a lot. Uh, Going back to the old, um, um, the very old third edition Star Wars role-playing game, they they released a supplement book, uh, Starships of the Galaxy, that specifically was a book about building custom starships. And I remember um, just being completely enamored with that book and that idea. Uh, it's something I want to include. I am worried about page count and how much goes into that. It may have to wait for a supplement book um, or maybe a later PDF release or something. Um, but it is something that is omnipresent on my mind because customization is so important to us. What I will say is we are planning to support Omega Horizon for a very long time. We are planning to eventually release supplement books uh, you know, each of these factions is a book in itself waiting to be written from locales to characters to additional equipment and ships and all these other things. And we want to bring all that to life and really flesh out this universe. Um, so uh, there will be more. So if it doesn't make its way into the core rule book, then eventually Starship customization will be on the way. Uh, all right. I, I can get that now. One of the other things I was curious about is in the in the um in the playtest document you've got you've got several entries regarding different um star systems and what their environments might be and what kind of threats you might have to deal with the, that kind of thing. Yep. Has there been has there been thought given to a, to a to a random system chart? Again, that goes into that deep customization, and it's something I do want to include. Um, whether or not it makes its way into the core rulebook, or whether or not we, we originally, um, in our first attempt at Kickstarter, were going to do a supplement book called Expanded Horizons, which was going to kind of cover every element of the core rulebook and just add more because there is so much to go into all this. Um, I think with a title like Expanded Horizons, I think that would make sense to maybe do a random planet generator rule set in there, because again, that is a chapter in itself, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, As you developing the core rulebook and expanding the core rulebook, I will be factoring in things like Starship customization and and planetary system uh, generation. Um, And if I think I can squeeze into the core rulebook, I'm going to try to squeeze everything I can there. But worst case scenario, it's not that it won't happen; it's that it may have to wait for that first supplement book. That ma- that makes sense. And with all, with all that said, um, I do want to con- I do want to give my congratulations because as we as we as we recorded this, the thing ended up going up by two hundred more. Um, <laughs> and and I do I am looking forward to seeing how Omega Horizon. Um, Take take shape as the as the weeks go in. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, no, we're very excited. I I uh, am humbled and grateful for the support of the community so far. I I was not expecting us to fund in under thirty minutes. I was not expecting you know in under twenty four hours to us to hit three hundred percent. We've now surpassed four hundred percent. Twenty six hours in, I am. Uh, just without words grateful um for everyone's support and i can't wait to to create this amazing game for everybody and and just keep developing it and developing this world and uh yeah yeah and with 
With all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to fi to find your way up, find your way up to the temple, and brave the hell of time zones. Sure. <laughs> to to come up and enjoy the madness, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss Omega Horizon, to to um to pick to pick on people who still unfortunately like Enterprise, um, <laughs> <laughs> or. Or or to sing the praises of Benjamin motherfucking Cisco, um, yeah. the doors the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you again, and uh, it was an absolute pleasure. I'm I'm always happy to uh, to stop by. And if I end up if I end up pissing off any enter any Enterprise fans with that, all I have to say is it's a free country, and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>